The Island of Gold, A Sailor's Yarn, by Gordon Stables. Book 1, Chapter 2. Life in the Woods. I trust that, from what he has already seen and heard of Rancy Tansy, the reader will not imagine I desire this little hero of mine to pose as a real saint. Boys should be boys while they have the chance. Alas they shall grow up into men far too soon, and then they needn't go long journeys to seek for sorrow, they will find it near home. And now I think, reader, you and I understand each other, to some extent at all events. Though I believe he was always manly and never mean, yet, as his biographer, I am bound to confess that there was just as much monkey mischief to the square inch about Rancy Tansy, as about any boy to whom I have ever had the honor of being introduced. It was said of the immortal George Washington that when a boy at school he climbed out of a bedroom window and robbed a wall fruit tree, because the other boys were cowards and afraid to do so. But George refused to eat even a bite of one of these apples himself. I think that Rancy Tansy could have surpassed young Washington, for not only would he have taken the apples, but eaten his own share of them afterwards. To do him justice, however, I must state that on occasions when his father went in the barge to a distant town on business, as he had been now for over a week, Rancy being left in charge of his tiny sister and the whole establishment, the sense of his great responsibility kept him entirely free from mischief. Now a very extraordinary thing happened on this particular morning, Rancy Tansy received a letter. The postman was sulky, to say the least of it. Pretty thing, he said, as he flung the letter with scant ceremony in through the open doorway, pretty thing as I should have to come three quarters of a mile round to fetch a letter to the like so you. Now, look, e here said Rancy, if ye're good and brings my letters every day, and hangs or stockin' out at Christmas time, I may put something in it. Gerlong, ye ragged young nipper. Rancy was dandling Babs upon his knee, but he now put her gently down beside the cat. Then he jumped up. I s e got to teach you a lesson, he said to the boorish postman, on the hadvantages o civility. I ain't a goins to waste a good pertator on such a sconce as yours, don't be afeard, but, airs and old termit turnip, ASLL meet the requirements o the occasion. It was indeed an old turnip, and well aimed too, for it caught the postman on the back of the neck and covered him with slush from head to toe. The lout yelled with rage, and flew at Rancy stick in hand. Next moment, and before he could deal the boy a blow, he was lying flat on the grass, with Bob standing triumphantly over him growling like a wild wolf. Call off our dog, and I won't say no more about it. Oh, ye won't, won't ye? I calls that wary considerate. But look, ye here, I ain't a goins to call Bob off, until ye begs my parting in a spirit o' humility, as T.O.L.D. Parson says. If ye don't, I'll hiss Bob on to ye, and why ye ll be a ragder nipper nor me afore Bob's finished the job to his own satisfaction. Well, discretion is the better part of valor, and after grumbling out an apology, the postman was allowed to sneak off with a whole skin. Then Rancy kissed Bob's shaggy head, and opened his letter. Dear Sonny, can't get home before four days. Look after Babs. Your loving father. That was all. The writing certainly left something to be desired, but it being the first letter the boy had ever received, he read it twice over to himself and twice over to Babs, then he put it away inside his New Testament. Hurrah, Babs! He cried, picking the child up again, and swinging her to and fro till she laughed and kicked and crowed with delight. Hurrah, Babs! Wheel all away to the woods! Marams shall keep house, and we'll take our dinner with us.
It was a droll procession. First walked Bob, looking extremely solemn and wise, and carrying Rancy's fishing rod. Close behind him came the tall and graceful crane, not quite so solemn as Bob, for he was catching flies, and his head and neck were in constant motion, and every now and then he would hop, first on one leg, and then on the other. Rancy Tansy himself brought up the rear, with a small bag slung in front of him, and Babs in a shawl on his back. Away to the woods. Yes, and there was a grand little stream there, and the boy knew precisely where the biggest fish lay, and meant to have some for supper. The leveret could hang for a few days. Arrived at his fishing ground, where the stream swept slowly through the darkling wood, Rancy lowered his back burden gently on the moss, and lay down on his face in front of her to talk Babs into the best of tempers. This was not difficult to do, for she was really a good-natured child, so he gave her his big clasp knife and his whistle, and proceeded to get his rod in order and make a cast. Bob lay down beside the tiny mite to guard her. She could whistle herself, but couldn't get Bob to do the same, although she rammed the whistle halfway down his throat, and afterwards showed him how she did it. Well, there are a few accomplishments that dogs cannot attain to, and I believe whistling is one of them. The fish were very kind today, and Rancy was making a very good bag. Whenever he had finished fishing in about 40 yards of stream, he threw down his rod and trotted off back for Babs, and placed her down about 20 yards ahead of him, fished another 40 yards and changed her position again, Bob always following close at the boy's heels and lying down beside his charge, and permitting himself to be pulled about, and teased, and cuddled, and kissed one moment, and hammered over the nose with that tin whistle the next. Even when Babs tried to gouge his eye out with a morsel of twig, he only lifted his head and licked her face till, half-blinded, she had to drop the stick and tumble on her back. Use a funny dog, Bob, she said, O-O-R tisses is so lock rough. Of course they were. He meant them to be, for Bob couldn't afford to lose an eye. I think the Admiral enjoyed himself quite as much as any one. He chose a bit of the stream for himself where the bank was soft, and there he waited and fished for goodness only knows what beetles, minnows, tiny frogs, anything alive and easy to swallow. I don't think, however, that the Admiral was a very good judge of his swallowing capabilities. That neck of his was so very, very long, and though distensible enough on the whole, sometimes he encountered difficulties that it was almost impossible to surmount. Tadpoles slid down easily enough, so did flies and other tiny insects, but a too big frog, if invited to go down head foremost, often had a disagreeable way of throwing his hind legs out at right angles to the entrance of the admiral's gullet. This placed the admiral in a somewhat awkward predicament. No bird can look his best with its beak held forcibly agape, and the two legs of a disorderly frog sticking out one at each side. The crane would hold his head in the air and consider for a bit then lower his face against the bank and rub one leg in, then change cheeks and rub the other in, but lo! While doing so, leg number one would be kicked out again, and by the time that was replaced out shot leg number two. It was very annoying and ridiculous. So the admiral would step cautiously onto the green bank, and stride very humbly down the stream to Rancy Tansy, with his neck extended and his head on a level with his shoulders. You see the confounded fix I'm in, he would say, looking up at his master with one wonderfully wise eye. Then Rancy would pull out the frog, and the little rascal would hop away, laughing to himself apparently. Croc, croc, cray, I. The admiral would cry, and go joyfully back to his fishing ground.
But sometimes Mr. Crane would swallow a big water beetle, and if this specimen had a will of its own, as beetles generally have, it would catch hold of the side of the gullet and hang on halfway down. I ain't going another step, the beetle would say, it isn't good enough. The road is too long and too dark. So this disobliging beetle would just stop there, making a kind of a mump in the poor admiral's neck. When Rancy saw his droll pet stride out of the pool and walk solemnly towards a tree and lean his head against it, and close his eyes, the lad knew pretty well what was the matter. There is nothing like patience and plenty of it, and presently the beetle would go to sleep, relax its hold, and slip quietly down to regions unknown. There would be no more mump now, and the crane would suddenly take leave of his senses with joy. Kike, kike, k, i. He would scream, and go madly hopping and dancing round the tree, a most weird and uncanny looking object, raising one leg at a time as high as he could, and swinging his head and neck fore and aft, low and aloft, from starboard to port, in such a droll way that, Rancy Tansy felt impelled to throw himself on his back, so as to laugh without bursting that much prized solitary suspender of his, while Bob sat up to bark, and Babs clapped her tiny hands and crowed. Rancy got tired of fishing at last, and made up his rod. There was some sort of silent joy or happiness away down at the bottom of the boy's heart, and for a moment he couldn't make out what was causing it. The big haul of fish he had caught. Oh, no, that was a common exploit. Having smashed the postman with a mushy turnip. That was capital, of course, but that wasn't it. Ah, now he has remembered, father was coming home in four days. Hurrah, he must have some fun on the head of it. Rancy loved to have a good time. But, duty first. Babs was a good little girl, or a dude, it'll durl, as she phrased it, but even good girls get hungry sometimes. Babs must be fed. She held her arms straight out towards him. Babs is deading tired, she lisped. So he took her up, kissed her, and made much of her for a minute, then set her against a tree where the moss was green and soft. With a bit of string and a burdock leaf he made her a beautiful bib, for though Rancy himself was scantily attired, the child was really prettily dressed. And now the boy produced a pickle bottle from the luncheon bag, likewise a small horn spoon. The pickle bottle contained a pap of bread and milk, and with this he proceeded to feed Babs somewhat after the manner of cramming turkeys, until she shook her head at last, and declared she would never eat any more, never, never, never. There was a turnip field not far off. Now Bob was as fond of raw turnips as his master. He knew where the field was, too. Off ye go for a termit, Bob, and mind ye bring a big un. I'll look after Babs till ye comes back. Bob wasn't long gone. He had obeyed his master's instructions to the very letter, in fact, he had pulled more than six turnips before he found one to please him. It is easy to teach a dog this trick, only stupid farmer folks sometimes don't see the fun of it. Farmer folks are obtuse, g.s. That termit made Bob and Rancy an excellent luncheon, and Babs had a slice to amuse herself with. The day was delightfully warm, and the wind soft and balmy. The sunshine filtered down through a great beech tree, and wherever it fell the grass was a brighter green or the dead leaves a lighter brown. Now and then a may beetle would go droning past, there were flies of all sorts and sizes, from the gnats that danced in thousands over the bushes to the great rainbow-like dragonfly that darted hither and thither across the stream, grasshoppers green and brown that alighted on a leaf one moment, gave a click the next, and hurled themselves into space, 
a blackbird making wild melody not far off, the bold lilt of a chaffinch, the insolent mocking notes of a thrush, and the coo-cooing of wood pigeons sounding mournfully from a thicket beyond the stream. High up in that beech tree myriads of bees were humming, though they could not be seen. No wonder that under such sweet drowsy influences Babs began to wink and wink, and blink and blink, till finally her wee head fell forward on her green bow bib. Babs was sound asleep, 